Hey guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bass. And today we're talking springtime swim bait fishing. Everything you need to know from where these fish are positioned and how to target them down to the different baits that we rely on to catch those fish. In much of the country, that spring transition is happening right now. Now it will last for a month or two, but we're right on the front end of the transition. And the moment that begins, it is time to start thinking swim baits. If you don't have a swim bait mixed into your arsenal, you are blowing the best opportunity of the year to catch a truly giant bass by targeting them with a large meal. Swim baits can be a great option year round, but no question they are at their absolute peak from now to May. This is the time when they shine and you really want to be throwing them during that time. Boy, it is beginning to rain actually we are in transition but that does not mean that every day is warm it is downright cold out here right now hopefully this just blows over it's just drizzling so what i want to do today i'm going to start off with the baits because that's a giant animal we'll cover baits when that's over i'm going to talk to you about the different areas that you want to be fishing for these fish depending on where you live and depending on the style of lake that you fish in. Now one of the biggest problems with swim bait fishing is the cost of the baits. I mean hands down you can go broke just trying to find a bait that will work for you. Uh, I'm going to tell you right up front I own such an insane array of baits. I mean, I've bought all the production baits over the years, the vast majority of custom baits over the years. You can spend a fortune trying to find that magical bait. I'm gonna tell you that of all the baits I own, I could count very easily the number of fish that I've caught on crazy expensive custom baits. At least the number of fish that were memorable, that were big ones. Uh, the vast majority of my damage, and this is good news, the vast majority of my damage, the vast majority of the double digits have all come on production baits. Baits that you can, you can roll into a tackle shop and you can just buy. You know, not baits that are hard to get, not baits that you're battling to get your hands on. Baits that are simple to get, that are simple to fish with, and have these very predictable actions. That's the thing about a lot of these factory production baits is that they're very consistent in their action and their behavior is easy to predict and it's easy to use to your advantage. So I'm gonna run you through some of these baits. And then again, we'll circle back on the where, the why, the how, the gear, all that stuff. Uh, but I just want you to know you don't have to go broke. Uh, when it comes to soft baits, I've got basically three categories and you probably don't even need all of them. What I want you to do is kind of listen through what I'm saying and listen for the ones that would apply to where you fish. Don't jump all in, don't buy 50 baits. Get two, three, four, five and focus on the ones that will work the best where you are. That's my goal for you today. Hard baits, I guess I've got those in four categories. And really it's less categories than that. I'm breaking them out further to make it easier for you. So in soft baits, we're basically, particularly in spring. Now we can, about once a year in the fall, we do an all in, in depth swim bait video. Uh, and it covers a lot more than this. But what we're doing in the springtime is very specific. The vast majority of it's shallow, not all, but the vast majority. And we're doing some very specific things to catch those fish so we can really narrow it up. Uh, so in the spring, three categories of soft baits. You've got wedge tail style baits. Okay, that's a wedge. That's a boot. And then I'm gonna separate these guys into their own category, even though they're the same thing, and that is bluegill profiled baits. Okay, that's it. 
Now, between those three categories, how do you decide which one applies the most to you? I'm gonna try to make this really easy before I even run through the baits. If your fish eat primarily trout and kokanee, now, if you don't know what your fish eat, that's a problem. Try to do some research online about your lake. Uh, if you're out there fishing, pay attention to what they're spitting up, right? Uh, what are the guys around you fishing for? If there's guys fishing on the bank, are they fishing for trout or are they fishing for bluegill? Do you see guys anchored up fishing for crappie? What are they doing? So if you've got trout and kokanee in your lake, it's so simple. Soft baits first. We'll do soft baits, then hard baits. Soft baits, you're throwing a wedge style tail in the spring, period. Now, I'm not telling you you can't catch them on a boot, but I'm telling you our goal here is to catch a giant, right? That's why I'm trying to help you throw a swim bait in the springtime. I want you to catch a new personal best. I also want you to put it back when you're done. We'll circle back on that. But I want you to catch a giant fish. So if they're eating trout and kokanee, you're throwing a wedge style tail. The end, okay? Keep it simple. And literally one of these two is where I would go. That's it. Uh, there's only two of them, so why don't I just talk about them really quick. The eight inch Huddleston, eight inch Savage Gear. Both phenomenal baits. The Savage Gear, this is the RTF. That stands for ready to fish. So it comes out of the package like this. Stinger hook already attached already hidden down in this channel on the back. Sits right down in there like that. That is straight out of the package, ready to rock, looks like a kokanee, just a phenomenal bait. This is a Huddleston, comes straight out of the pack just like that. If you wanna add a stinger, you need to do that yourself. Uh, we've done some great videos over the years about how to do that. I'll tell you what, in the video description, I will include the full in-depth swim bait seminar in case you want that and a, a soft bait rigging video in case you need to add a stinger hook. More often than not, you don't, especially if we're talking giant largemouth, they will vacuum up an eight inch bait whole like it is not even there. I mean, you see us pull these back out of the fish's mouth and you're like, how does that even fit in there? But it does. They gulp it in one motion, just boom, gone. One of those two baits. That's it. Now, can you throw a smaller one? There's a 68 Huddleston. There's the eight inch. Of course you can. But if you're gonna listen to my advice, trout and kokanee guys, eight inch. Now you can throw bigger, you can throw the 10 inch, but I'm trying to play the odds for you. The eight inch is the magical size. That is the size that is big enough to have phenomenal drawing power, to pull fish over incredible distances in clear water to eat the bait, but it's also small enough that a two, three, four, five pounder will often take the shot. It's not just the sevens, eights, tens, 14s, 18 pounders that will eat it. Now they will. My 17 pounder was caught on an eight inch Huddleston. ROF five is actually what I caught mine on, but this is a 12 and it's by far my favorite. If I take my 17 out of the mix and just look at general fish catches, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fish on the ROF 12 with a bear jig hook. That is a bait I have a ton of confidence on. Same deal here. So oftentimes I remove this stinger hook because I don't feel like I need it. But if you're getting short strikes, you can leave that on there. But a straight jig hook with the right rod will put them in the boat. So eight inch is the magical size. It can still get the smaller fish, but the giants won't turn away from it because it's not enough for them. You'll get more bites than you will on a 10 inch. You'll catch consistently better fish than you will on a six inch because they will come farther for it. The majority of trout that fish are eating in these lakes are bigger than six inches, right? They're eight inch, nine inch, 10 inch trout. So it's in the right size profile. Trout and kokanee guys, it was that easy. You know what? Let's just wrap it the rest of the way up for you. The only other thing that I throw under that circumstance, well, there is a wake bait. We'll come to that at the very, very end. The other thing that I throw is open water glide baits. Man, it is cold. I'm freezing. When it comes to glide baits, so glide baits have a single joint and they have this S 
swim in the water. And a good open water glide has that S swim on its own. You don't have to do any of this real chopping. You don't have to do that. Steady retrieve and that bait will have a wide natural glide. And that wider glide is really important in that wide open clear water, which is what most trout and kokanee lakes are. Most of them are highland. Most of them have five, 10, 20, 30 feet of visibility. We throw those wider glides because they spend their time swimming and they're not coming to the boat as quickly as a bait that's doing this. So the fish have time to spot them and to rise to the bait. They can get there before it's completely gone. So it's easier for them to attack and eat that bait. So baits like the Papa Pete, an S Waver 200, that's the smallest of my open water glides. And then my favorite in terms of bang for the buck, if you want to catch a giant, is a Bait Sanity Explorer. Uh, you're talking about a bait that has a phenomenal action, will catch absolute giants, and in the world of big swim baits, won't break the bank. None of these will. All three of these in the world of big swim baits are super affordable uh, and just do a great job in that big, wide, open water. And you don't need them all. Pick a favorite or two, just give it a try. Okay, trout and kokanee guys, we got that box checked. Let's talk about the whole rest of the country, okay? The rest of guys, we're dealing with shad eaters, herring eaters, shiner eaters, bluegill eaters, right? That's the majority of the country. I keep looking this way because that's where the wind is coming from and I'm looking at this cloud. It the temperature is crashing while I'm sitting here. My hands are going numb. My feet, on the other hand, are perfectly fine, but my hands are freezing. All right, back to spring swim baits. So how do you know what profiles to throw? I'm gonna make this really simple for you. We'll do soft baits first, okay? If they're specifically bluegill eaters, if your fish are pushed into the backs of the pockets. They're up around grass, they're up around really shallow wood, right? They're right up shallow, they're probably bluegill eaters. If you're a pond guy, they are certainly bluegill eaters. Unless someone has gone out of their way to stock shiners in there, it's bluegill. The rest of the guys, it could be shad, it could be shiners, it could be herring, it could be all these different things. But it's really, really simple. If it's any of those things, we're throwing a boot unless the water is totally clear, right? Sometimes you'll see that. You get into these southern states and one fishery will be murky. The next one will just be crystal, super clear water. There's no trout and kokanee in there, but the water's really clear. That's where these guys come into play, okay? Shad profiles or shiner Profiles, that's a Savage Gear wedge tail. Matt Lure Shed, wedge tail. Huddleston 68, wedge tail. The clearer the water, the more we're going to lean to the wedge rather than the boot. Okay, and I'll link all these baits in the video description to make it really, really easy for you. Don't feel like you have to, as fast as you can, write notes or anything. I will break it all out in the video description. Hopefully I can get it all the fit. But that wedge style tail is a more realistic look as it's swimming through the water, okay? It just has an amazing look. And I think the clearer the water, the more likely fish are to respond to that look. The less clear the water, the more murky. And I'm not talking muddy, I'm talking less than seven, eight, 10 feet of visibility, okay? It can still be really clear. Boot tails take over. And boot tails for me are really simple. If I'm just chucking and winding, the burrito has really taken over for me recently. The burrito is a bait that when you're going fast, has a ton of vibration to it. Almost, compared to other swim baits, it's almost like a chatterbait. I mean, it is out there thumping, you can feel it. Uh, and I, we did really well with it last summer, fishing offshore, fishing deep, but there is a time and a place in the spring 
for shallow water fishing. And I didn't really even cover that talking trout and kokanee. Those baits can be crawled deep on bottom, just ultra slow crawled. And that's how a lot of the true giants are caught, the high teeners, just creeping because those fish don't want to hunt. They can sit next to an object on the bottom and you come crawling by and they just, they just vacuum it up. But way more fun than that is waiting for warm afternoons in the spring. The warmer it gets, the more comfortable you get. That hoodie comes off. Those fish are likely to be up there in less than five foot of water sunning themselves. And they're up there, they're warmer, they're far more likely to chase. So even in a trout and kokanee lake, you'll find me burning up bank. Going down the bank, chucking that thing as far out there as I can get it and just winding it back. And my speed, I'll test it on the side of the boat. If it looks like this, like it's just out for a leisurely swim, that's too slow. I, I try to take it one notch above that. I want it to look a little bit panicked, like something's wrong, like it was running from somebody else and oh no, it just ran into this, this bass here. She's gonna see that it's a little panicked and clobber it. They just react to that. That's something that I have done I hate to say for decades, but for decades, it's crazy. We've been swim baiting a long time. Fishing that shallow, when everybody else is all anchored up and bottom crawling, we're fishing like we're throwing spinner baits and just, when they eat it at that speed, it's amazing. They clobber it. Now, back to this, same concept. I love those warmer days to just cover water. And when you're covering water with this bait, that tail is thumping so hard. Now, what I was hinting at is it, it has to do with what your fish are eating, right? Shiners, shad, those different things. Threadfin shad tend to be smaller. They don't seem to impact it as much. Gizzard shad, golden shiner, herring, they have a different way of swimming than say trout or smaller shad or bluegill. They've got a way that they, they flick that tail and go. That's why that boot tail is so exceptional. It imitates that wider, more aggressive kick that they do. Uh, and that's why the only time I don't do it is in really clear water. Because in clear water, the fish can get too good of a look at it and you're better off with just that, that bait back there kicking more than the vibration. Murkier water, vibration rules. So that bait right there is amazing for just chucking, winding, covering water. They released it in a medium sink recently, which is even better, but the medium sink or the heavy, just going. If I wanna go slower, oh, I've got water on the lens, hang on. If I wanna go slower, I turn to the mag draft. That's a bait that comes with a belly treble and it is a much slower, leisurely, slow kicking tail. This is a bait that I'll do the same thing with, but when I feel like I know where the fish are. So one bait is like running and gunning, going down the shore, just searching. If I've put some time into this lake and I know, hey, right over there, there's a lay down and she's probably gonna be in there. Then I go to that slower bait because a mag draft just has this one perfect speed. Throw it out, find the speed. It'll look a little funny and then it'll get into the speed and it's just, it's got that perfect speed. Throw it out there, find my perfect speed and then run it over the top of that piece of cover right where I think that fish is. They'll pin that thing to the surface and blast it. Now again, that needs shallower water in the early season. We get to the tail end, we start talking May, post-spawn, those fish will come up out of 20 feet of water to blast it. The water's warmer. But if we're talking February, March, we're talking super slow rolling, less than five foot, where it's easy for them to reach out and get that thing. And then last is going to be my weedless baits. There are a lot of weedless options on the market. I try to keep it super, super simple. My smaller bait is going to be the mag draft freestyle. 
rigged on a beast. That's an ADOT beast. This is a Scottsboro, slightly larger bait. Slightly, just bigger profiled body, but very similar overall on a 10 aught. Those two baits just rock because I can do all the above with it. I can throw it dirt, dirt shallow and I can bump it through cover. If my lay down is in a little deeper water and I don't feel like I can get the mag draft in there effectively, I take these and I throw them out there, let them hit bottom and I just roll it right through, just bump, 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 just banging through the branches, trying to get those fish to react. Again, golden shiners, gizzard shad, herring, bigger profiled bait fish. That's where that's going to shine. Man, it is, it's actually going to rain. It's coming down pretty good now. It's chilly. That's okay. One last tip here. Notice that I tipped my hook point up. It's not actually stuck in the back like this. It's sticking up and out. If I run my finger down, it will catch. If I'm not fishing thick in the cover, I take that beast hook and I bend it ever so slightly. And I find that my hookup ratio goes way, way up gets much, much better. I'll get way more of those bites hooked up and in the boat, just with that tiny little kick of the hook point. Last but not least, bluegill profiles. When it comes to bluegill profiles, I personally like wedge. This is the Matt Lures hammer tail, wedge style tail. Straight retrieve bait, chuck it out there wind it back, they will mow that thing down. The nice thing about a wedge is you can fish it fast or slow, but it's a great profile. And then the other two are the Savage Gears, the RTF and the Line Through. I really fell in love with this Line Through last spring. I had great, great results with it. You guys have seen a bunch of underwater video of this guy getting crushed. They just, they just mow it down. They like eating that bait. It's a tiny profile. When you hook them on this little hook, get them in the boat. Do not mess around. Don't let them jump. It's such a small hook compared to the size of the bait that when they come up thrashing, and really this is true of all the baits, when they come up thrashing, they can get a swim bait out. So when you hook them, bulldog them, drag them, get them in the boat. The less they jump, the better. Now, line through kind of defeats that. You hook them on this, bait slides up the line, your odds go up. You can rig this on the belly or up here on the back. On the back, I stay with that smaller stock hook. If I was gonna guess, that's like a size, it's kind of an odd size. It's like a size three. If I'm rigging on the belly, I will upsize that hook. I'll go to a size two an owner 3X size two, just fits on there just fine. But this bait, it's one of the better bluegill baits I've seen in a very, very long time. Phenomenal colors, amazing swim. I love that I can rig it both ways. Uh, I really like the belly rigging, but I'm gonna say this about any soft bait. Belly hooks hook up extremely well. The problem is, that when a bass sucks that in, the hook points are on the bottom side and more likely to stick them in the gills. You're more likely to kill a bass. And if you catch the fish of a lifetime, you don't wanna kill it, nobody wants to. So if I can get away with it, I fish my hook up on the back. But if I'm trying to cover a ton of water, stay over the top of cover, sometimes you just have to fish a belly treble. You just have to. Uh, but just be aware of that, okay? Don't go rigging, like if you have a mag draft, throw that single belly treble. Don't go rigging a double treble system down here and gut hook a fish and just stick them full of treble hooks in their gills. You're gonna kill them. Minimize that, okay? Go with as little hook on the belly as you can. Those jig hook baits, it's all on the back. And I almost never never hit those fish in the gills with a top hook. That's why I like those top hooks so much. They just work if you've got them paired up to the right rod. Okay, with that, we wrap up soft baits. So let me pile these out of my way so I can focus here. We've already talked open water glides. 
by far my personal favorite thing in spring. Man, Ooh. my personal favorite thing in spring is cover glides. Smaller glide baits, very tight action. These are not doing that $500 custom lure thing. They're not, they're like this, right there. That's all they do. It works. I don't understand why more people don't do it. They work so well. The beauty of a cover glide, and that's a term that we coined a few years ago to try and explain the difference between an open water bait and a bait that we fish in and around cover. These cover glides, S Waver 168, G Rat Sneaky Pete, these are baits that we fish up in the shallows with intention. What I mean by that, what I mean by that is that we fish them right where we think the fish are. Throw it down a dock, slow roll it, get to the piling, twitch, twitch, try and get them to react to it. Fishing down the bank, you see a little stick up, throw right to the stick up, right when you get there, twitch, twitch. So that bait's got that slow roll and then pop, pop. It looks like from the fish's perspective, they're tracking this thing, it's slow swimming in front of them and then it turns, sees them and then kicks to make its run. They're either going to commit and blast it or they're gonna let it go. The vast majority of my cover glide bites come when I do that double twitch, right on the second twitch, right when the bait goes to run, that's when they smoke it. They work so well. I mean, I would argue they work better than almost anything at specifically targeting giant fish in shallow water around cover. It's incredible how well they work. It's one of my favorite things to do. I will never go fishing in the spring where I don't have one tied on. They work that well. Color wise, a light trout is my all time favorite S waiver. It's bright yellow. It looks like nothing. It doesn't matter. It's about action and visibility. In clear water, it's about making sure they see it. This is a major thing for you. I throw very few clearer colors. Personally, I like the opaque, bold colors. So I like light trout, I like warden, I like bluegill. Bold colors, easy to see. In the sneaky, I like the hitch colors. They're easy to see, they're bold. And this one has even more sound than an S waiver. It's loud. These fish can find it even in muddy water. I can't tell you how many fish I've caught on these baits where there's foot, foot and a half of visibility. People don't want to throw a swim bait in that. Well, bass want to eat in that. They will blast it and they will blast it at the boat and scare you half to death because they're right there and a giant mouth comes out and in their mind pins that bait to the boat. They're using the boat to hunt a meal and they will crush it right there. It's so awesome. Oh, I get amped up about it. Multi-joint baits. I keep very, very simple. Okay, smaller size triple trouts and the smaller size buka, the bull shad, six inch and seven inch, seven inch and eight inch. Keep it really simple. You don't need a bunch of baits in a bunch of sizes. I've got that in a six or a seven, I'm good to go. These baits for me come into play a little bit later. I'm not throwing them in February personally, at least not where I'm fishing. If you're in a warmer area, you probably are. But those baits, you burn them. Burn, 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 burn. Pause, burn, burn, pause, burn, burn, pause. Super aggressive and that bait has this, it's just almost like a lipless crankbait and then when you pause, it cuts out and then you take off again. If those fish come charging after it, they get going so fast trying to catch up and when it cuts, they just plow that thing. They let it have it. So those are really good options as that water gets a little bit warmer and those fish get right up shallow and you can just waylay them with it. I'll leave it at that, really simple and because I am starting to freeze. All right, bluegill baits. This is the bullgill. So bluegill profiled, 
but doesn't have a lot of bluegill fins on it. The problem with bluegill style baits, and I've said this many times, is that a bluegill is a hard shape for a bass to eat. I mean, in nature, if you find a bass floating that is choked on something and it's dying, it's almost always a bluegill. It's hard for them to eat bluegill. They're covered in spines and they're a weird shape. So my bluegill baits, I prefer them to be smaller profiled, smoother, not a lot of big fins. I'm not throwing those big, tall bluegill baits. You can get bit on those baits, but more often than not, you miss. They pop them and they just don't get the hooks. There's a lot of profile there. This is one where they can just eat it whole. It's easy for them to get it. That's a bait that just like the bull shad, burn, pause, burn, pause, burn, pause. Right on that pause, they clobber it. That's when the bite happens. The Vitalian is like a hybrid bait. I always include it in a swim bait video, but it's, it's barely a swim bait. It's almost like an oversized jointed lipless. But same deal, I'm burning, stopping, burning, stopping. And I'm not burning it for 20 feet. I burn it for like two feet. They clobber it. It's loud. It's more like a lipless than anything. If you're a pond guy, if you're a murky water guy, they're eating bluegills, that will catch them. Comes with fairly light wire hardware. You can be good with that, but I go to a little bit heavier hardware. I go to a 3X hook and a hyper wire split ring, just stronger hardware, and I let them have it. Throw it on heavier line, burn, stop, burn, stop, burn, stop. When they cold stop it, I clobber them. That's a really fun bait. The last one is the Ganterelle. Again, narrower profile. This is the standard Ganterelle, that's the Junior. Both can be good. I focus almost all my time on the full size, but if you're a pond guy, maybe you wanna go Junior, okay? The way you fish them is the same. Any of the bluegill profiles will work. There's this one, this one that's more metallic. There's one that's really ghosty. Uh, all the bluegill profiles work. I just, I catch them on all of them. It doesn't seem to matter. You can see teeth marks all over the back of this bait. See them in there? I mean, they just mow these baits down. So the Ganterelle is kind of a, a different animal. And it's actually really hard for me to switch between those profiles because the way you fish them is so different. I think a lot of people miss the boat on a Ganterelle. The Ganterelle is the opposite. I slow roll and then I pause. Slow roll, pause. So where the Buca or the Vitalian is flying and then cuts, flies, cuts. The Ganterelle is like, it's almost like a glide bait. And then you stop and it just wanders away and just sort of drifts off. And then you start again. And then you pause and it drifts off. What's interesting about it is that when I stop and it does its little drift, it's a much more methodical approach. It's not so aggressive. When it does its drift off, you go semi slack. So a lot of times when they clobber it, I don't even feel them. I'll, I'll do my thing, I'll pause, and then as soon as I turn the handle, it's heavy. They have got it, and boom, crack them. Now sometimes they'll hit it going the other way and it, it jerks, but a lot of times I'm just half asleep doing my Ganterell thing and then, oh, that's a fish. They just load up on it, but it catches big ones and it's much slower moving. Uh, in the world of bluegill type hard baits, it's the slowest, most methodical of the bunch and catches them really well when they're not as aggressive. All right, let me clean this lens again. It's getting covered in water and we'll cover the very last little bit of, of the baits. Well, I powered down the camera to wipe the water off and wouldn't you know it, water got into the microphone and psh. So we had to jam back, get another camera. The good news, is that the storm has broken and now it's beautiful. So let's wrap this up. One more set of baits, then gear, and then let's talk about where these fish are so you guys understand exactly how to approach them and how to catch them.
Now the last category is actually top water, which again, seems crazy to talk about this time of year, but it's not. Uh, we talked recently, we, we did an underwater video, taking a look at fish blowing up on top water. And we were talking about out of season, you know, early spring. It's even more so when you start talking about the swim bait game. Fish are willing to eat a big, slow meal in cold water. So three baits is it. Um, the first one, this is the big spro, the eight inch spro. And this is a bait we've thrown for a very long time. If you're a trout and kokanee guy, this is one of those baits I would turn to. Uh, it's a full size, full profile. It does not have a bill. And it's one of the only big top waters I like that isn't billed. Usually on a wake bait, I like them to be billed. And I'll get into that in a second. The thing about the Spro is that it's got a rattle in it. It's a loud, obnoxious bait. On a steady, slow roll, it's got a great swim and then if you stop it'll just sort of drift off very ganterell like frankly uh just that same sort of wandering and then out it goes i really like this bait early season because of its size and because of the ruckus it's creating so when those fish get really shallow if you're going to do the top water thing i like to do it on those really warm afternoons the warmer, the better. Those fish push up shallow. They want to get warmed up. They want to get comfortable. And you run a big bait a couple of feet over their heads, it's worth it for them to take the shot. And don't be afraid to go slow. As slow as you can go and still have that bait swimming, okay? Speed is key. Slower is better. Now, the other two, we've got a bluegill imitator and we've got a rat. So Mike Buka, bull shad, he's also got a lip to bait. Now, when it traditionally, for me personally, wake baits, I like a lip to bait and a soft tail. I just feel like I have my best hookup ratio there, that lip will push a big wake of water. So it creates a big V on the surface, a lot of presence. Even though the bait is significantly smaller, it has a very large presence in the water and you just slow roll and just let it push a V. Soft tails just claps and get out of the way when those fish hit the back portion of that bait. So that's a really good bluegill imitator. And then last is this guy, this is a PB rat. Notice it's the single joint, okay? That's not by accident. For a very long time, I have believed that single joint lipped wake baits get the biggest bites. My theory is that they look a little off. They look messed up. Okay, when you're up there in the shallows, if this was a multi-piece bait, it would have this great flow, like the, the uh, three-piece rat, the four-piece rat, they get really snaky. The single joint doesn't. It's got a good look, it's pushing a big V, but it just has a little bit of an awkward vibe to it. I believe that's what those big fish target. When they're sitting in those shallows and they don't wanna have to chase down a meal, they just wanna take a quick shot and blast it. An injured bait, something that's given off that vibe that it can't run, something's just a little bit wrong with it, that's when those big ones go, I'm gonna eat that one. <clears throat> they blast it off the surface. And, and I say blast it off the surface. Sometimes they blast it, other times they'll just lift up and with that great big bucket mouth, they just, they just vacuum it down. It's nothing but a ripple on the surface. Your bait just disappears. You feel that dunk. Oh, when they do that, when they just flush it under, it's a big one. So top water, super simple, All right? One bigger bait, one bluegill imitator, one rat style bait and call it a day. Um, the big thing about top water is we're talking way less bites, okay? 
glide baits, soft baits. Those are baits where you can get a lot of bites. A lot of people are thinking, you know, I'm gonna go throw a swim bait all day and pray I get a bite. And on some fisheries that might be true, but when you get this thing dialed in, if you're on a good fishery, you can get two, five, 10, 20, 40 bites a day on a big bait. You're not giving up all of your bites. The idea is to figure out how to catch them and how to catch the really big ones. The top water, however, is going to be a lot less bites. But when they take the shot, they tend to be the absolute largest class of fish. Those are the ones that are willing to do it. So just keep that in mind this spring. And if you want to take a crack at top water, even in the cold water, do it. I've caught them on big trout imitators in January in water in the 40s in 30 and 40 feet of water if it's clear by dead sticking. There's not a time of year where they won't eat a top water. There is a time of year where they won't eat traditional top water. But when you start talking about giant baits, if they're going slow enough or not moving at all, it's always worth that giant fish's time and effort to get that big giant meal. So there's not an off limit times of year, time of year for top water like there is traditional baits. Okay, now let's talk rods and reels and gear, and then we'll circle back and we'll talk about the where and the how, okay? Uh, if you've watched any of our seminar style videos, you guys know that the, the Loomis IMX Pro 966 is my favorite swim bait rod because I can throw a treble hook and, or excuse me, a jig hook, and I can throw a treble hook bait on the same rod, and that is extremely rare. So the 966 is my personal favorite swim bait rod. I pair it up to a Trinx 300 and a power handle. And then I go 80 pound braid most of the time to a heavy leader, 30, 35 pound leader. With a big swim bait, if you're presenting it properly, they see the bait, they don't see the line. They're looking at the giant meal. They're not looking out in front of it. So I don't worry about that line size. I run a lot of really big line so that when a monster eats it, when a 10 pounder, a 12 pounder eats it, the odds of me getting them to the boat goes way up. I don't wanna go through all the effort, all the money, the time invested, the effort, get the bite and then break them off. So I go with the heaviest line I can get away with without losing the bites themselves. If I start seeing my bites go down, I go to lighter line until I figure out what my maximum is on that lake. But given a choice, 30 to 35 pound liter, I go all in. Now, that's my favorite combo. But that said, there are great combos at every price point. Uh, I do focus my attention around those 300 size reels. I didn't in the past. In the past, I used round reels. I used the Calcutta TEs, I used the Calcutta 400B, that was my primary swim bait reel. But these low profiles have come so far. You know, the Tranks, the Corrado, uh, the A3, a lot of these reels have come really far and you're able to get all that power and all that strength without having to go up to like a 400 size round reel. Uh, I almost don't even throw round reels anymore, which is crazy because that's all I used to do. I love low profiles. So you guys know, historically, Dobbins Fury, incredible budget rod. Uh, another one last year, I just fell in love with the squad. So this is a Savage Gear squad, eight foot heavy, phenomenal for treble hooked baits. The extra heavy, phenomenal for jig hook baits. I mean, for the price, probably untouchable so far. Uh, but I'm constantly looking. This is constantly developing. So I've been putting a bunch of time into the 13, uh, which has proven to be an excellent, excellent jig hook rod. Uh, the thing is you can pick a heavy from all the brands or an extra heavy from all the brands. They're not the same. So like that squad heavy, great for treble hooks. This 13 heavy, great for jig hooks. It's significantly stouter. Uh, another one that I've been playing with and will continue to play with, St. Croix, that SB Ranger. I picked this one up 
and I picked up the new one in the Bass X as well. I'm just constantly trying the new rods that hit the market, trying to find the best bang for the buck. You know, the Victory, the Omen, these guys are more of those middle price ranges, right? You've got Fury, you've got Squad, those are budget and they're great. Um, on the high end, I've got my IMX Pro, my favorite swim bait rod. I'm trying to find the rods in between. So we're constantly experimenting. Uh, and I'll link them all in the video description for you. Um, but as new ones come out, we'll be trying all of those too. Now, let's get down to the, the nuts and bolts of it. Where are these fish? Okay. This is the stuff you really need to know. Pick a couple of baits. Do get, if you're going to get serious, do get a quality swim bait setup. This is one of the few techniques where I'm adamant you need one. And the reason why is because of your time and financial investment and the caliber of fish you're after. You know, a lot of times I talk about MBR action rods, like you can throw a top water and a jig and a spinner bait on the same rod. Well, when it comes to proper big swim baiting, do not spend all the money on your truck and boat, all the money on the swim baits, the gas money, everything else, go out, invest all your time, and then get a giant bite, and because you've got the wrong rod, lose the fish of a lifetime. That's horrible. This is one of the few techniques where a dedicated rod at the last second will make all the difference in the world, the difference between a fish of a lifetime and not. Uh, so get your quality gear, but after that, it's all about where are they? Okay, let's jump into that for a second. Depending on what your fish are eating, whether they're eating trout and kokanee, they're eating bluegill, or they're eating bait fish, the locations change drastically, as does how the fish position, okay? I'm just gonna break it down for you right here, right now, talking springtime. This is going to make a huge difference for you. If your fish are eating trout and kokanee, get out a map of your lake. Get on Google Earth, take a look at the lake. Find the boat ramp where they stalk the trout, okay? If they stalk trout in your lake, find that boat ramp. Now find the closest major point to that boat ramp. That is where the biggest fish on your lake lives, period. That's it. That's where they live. That part's easy. Catching them, whole different ball game. What you need to do is understand that now that you know where they are, so do some other people most likely, it's going to take a time commitment, right? You need to cross paths because we're not talking about fooling a two pounder. We're talking about fooling the fish of a lifetime, possibly the absolute biggest fish in the lake. In order to pull that off, it's going to take the right bait at the right location at the right time. What I've learned over the years is that on a well-stocked trout lake, the fish seem to feed about every three days. Now they're not all on the same schedule. It's not like they're gonna crush it today and then nothing, right? Every fish is on a different schedule. But on the lakes that I used to put a lot of time into, if they stalk trout and you missed it, so they had all eaten, it's about three days before you'd start getting bit well again. That just seems to be about how often they feed. So with that in mind, know that if you're out there grinding away and you know where the spot is, you still have to time perfectly somewhere in that three day window when that big one wants to feed and then you have to fool her. And weather can come into play with that, the right bait obviously, uh, lighting. So just know that you are, you're fighting an uphill battle but you're fighting the right battle. Put the time in on the right spots, eventually she will make a mistake. Now, if they don't stalk trout into the lake, if it's natural, they're just going to be on those outer points. Okay, take a look at your map, find those best outside points. If it's a smaller lake, find the best outside structures. What you need to understand is that trout and kokanee tend to spend their time off the bank. So the fish that are eating them tend to look out. Okay, and I'll explain that a little bit more here in a minute, but your fish will be looking out away from the bank. 
So more often than not, you don't have to land the bait in six inches of water. As long as you get up there close and you're winding out, they're gonna spot it and they're gonna track it. Now, that's also the reason why it's really wise to get uphill, throw out deep, let it hit bottom, and crawl back up slow. That's why we do that, because the fish are looking out. So you'll come up to them. But again, there's this window in the spring where I like to just chuck and wind. I just have a blast doing it and I do really well catching big ones with that. So I just take all that and I throw it away and I just go for it. But I'm not trying to land in a foot of water because they're not up there. They're gonna be out a little ways looking out. So I land behind them, start rolling past them and they'll come after it if it's warm. Now, bluegill guys, your situation is literally the opposite. Bluegills as a whole like to be in the cover. Right? They like to be in brush, they like to be under docks, they like to be down in the holes in the rocks. So your fish will face the cover, which generally means they're looking at the bank. So trout and kokanee guys, your fish look offshore. Bluegill guys, they face the shore. That has a huge impact on where and how you present your baits. For you, close quarters, tight to the bank, is a major deal. Now, if your fish are on isolated cover, right? There's, you know that there's a tree laying out there, that's a different ball game. But if you don't, if you're just fishing, fish your baits parallel to shore and stay up there in the shallows because the fish are sitting out, looking at the bank. So if you come in between, they're, what they think they're doing is pinning that bluegill to the shore and they're gonna kill it up there but really it's your lure and they're gonna eat it from the outside direction. That's where they're coming from. It's very consistent. Again, because of where the bait fish, in this case, bluegill, like to hide, the bass have adapted to that. So your fish are going to be around docks, around laydowns, around brush piles, around rock piles. They can be on cover or structure, it just depends on the fishery. But those bait fish, those bluegill, will want to be in something if they can. If there's grass, they're in the grass. Those fish will be on the edges of that, hunting them. So backs of pockets, dock lines, it's really not that hard. You wanna be up in the shallows. Now for the guys where your fish are eating shiners, big shad, all that stuff, they can be almost anywhere. Both situations can be a factor. But again, the bass that you can catch, there can be bass everywhere that will ambush a shad as it goes by, right? It could be on a point in 40 feet of water. It could be in a foot of water on a bluff wall. But the ones that you want to target are the ones that are trying to corral bait. So it tends to be very similar to bluegill eaters. They tend to be the fish that are facing the shore and you wanna be between them and the cover. Okay, and then let them hunt you. Uh, so again, I spend a lot of time this time of year chuck and winding along the bank. If I know there's a piece of cover, I'm trying to fish that piece of cover. Try to run right by it. With a soft bait, you're just trying to swim past it. With a hard bait, I'm trying to get right up to it and then get aggressive like I've busted that fish and get them to attack. But you want to be around that cover. Now, if you're on a lake that doesn't have a lot of cover, but it does have shiners, shad, etc., then those fish will set up on those points more like a trout eater and they'll ambush out there. But given a choice, they'll be corralling back into shallows and into pockets and into cover. That's where those fish prefer to be. So hopefully that helps you guys. You want to get out there this spring. Spring is an amazing time. It's starting now and it's running till May, June. You've got time. We did this video early. Now, if you're a Southern guy, it's not early. You got to get to it. But for most of the country, this video is early. It's right at the beginning. We did that so that you can get your baits. You can get your gear. You can get them spooled up, get comfortable with them. And you're still going to have plenty of time to pursue that fish of a lifetime. Now, last thing, and I want to emphasize this, I mentioned it in the beginning, that is turning these fish loose, and it's also being very careful with them. These giant fish, these are the grandmas. 
They really are. These are giant females that have already lived the bulk of their life. You have to treat them very carefully. You abuse these fish, they die. Uh, these are not the fish you want to keep. In a perfect scenario, if you catch a giant, get a picture. If you plan to get a mount done, get quick measurements, turn them loose. Replicas are amazing. Skin mounts, which is what we all did when we were little kids, skin mounts fall apart over time. They just do. Replicas don't. They're a better product. 40 years from now, a replica will still look good. A skin mount will look like garbage. But for a fish to grow giant, it's incredibly difficult. The genetics have to be right, the environment has to be right, and then it just all has to go in their favor. So when you catch one of those monster fish, if you take them out of that fishery, the odds of that lake growing a super giant just dropped drastically. Because just for a fish to get to wherever that one was is difficult. So just keep that in mind. What do you want in the future? Is this the absolute biggest fish you want out of that lake or do you want it to keep growing and become a monster, keep putting good genetics in the water? Uh, just think it through because we really are giving you the keys to catch the biggest fish in the lake. And then it's your, it's your lake, right? We probably don't fish the same place. Statistically speaking, I probably haven't been to your lake. Now, granted, we travel like crazy, so maybe we have, but this is your lake. It's going to impact you more than me. How you care for your lake matters. I've seen it play out many times. So handle these fish carefully. Be careful uh, how you rig hooks onto those baits. Again, try to keep them out of the gills. Be very mindful of how long you keep a big fish out of the water. If you want to turn them loose, if that's your goal, keep them out of the water for a very short period of time. Get them unhooked, get them back in the water while you get a camera ready. Whether that's the live well or in your hand in the water or in the net in the water. But keep them in the water then get your quick pictures and then release them. The sooner they're set free, the better the odds that they're going to survive. I just wanna tack that on the end because it really is important. This information is quality enough that you really can negatively impact your lake. So can other people. So we wanna be responsible. All right, guys, I'll stop beating you over the head about that. Uh, it, it's just something I'm passionate about, but I'm also very passionate about swim bait fishing as a whole. I'm passionate about watching people like you catch PBs. I love it. I wanna see everybody catch a giant. So get out there this spring, get geared up, put in the time, and when you do catch the fish of a lifetime, when you do catch your personal best, let us know about it. If you guys enjoyed the video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll talk to you soon.